Hi, everybody. It's still October 15 for a few more seconds. Historic Midwest blizzard has farmers expecting massive crop losses as devastating as we've ever seen. This is happening in so many countries. I'm going to be I'm going to be focusing on what's happening in Australia. But the farmers here in the United States have been so devastated this past year. More have been killing themselves, more going bankrupt, and harvest, well, this affects all of us. It affects every one of us. Blizzard that just hit just before harvest time has absolutely devastated farms all across the U.S. heartland. North Dakota is saying that the crop losses will be as devastating as we've ever seen due to endless rain and horrific flooding early this year. Many farmers in the middle of the country face very serious delays in getting their crops planted, so we really needed good weather at the end of the season. Well, they didn't get it. They did not get it. What they got was a very early snowstorm. It's been the worst crop disaster that the Midwest has ever seen, and ultimately this crisis is going to affect all of us. So according to the USDA, only 15% of all U.S. corn and only 14% of all U.S. soybeans had been harvested as of October 6. Only 58% of U.S. corn was mature as of August 6, and just 15% harvested. North Dakota's crop was furthest behind with just 22% of corn mature and none harvested as of Sunday, while South Dakota's corn was 36% mature with only 2% harvested. U.S. soybeans were only 14% harvested as of Sunday, 20% points behind the average pace. USDA data showed uh, North Dakota and Minnesota beans were just 8% gathered while Iowa's and South Dakota's crop was only 5% harvested. What does that mean? Less food, higher prices, and the destruction of U.S. farming, independent farming. No, the economy is not doing well. Missouri River flooding expected to continue, continue into December, killing off more farms. Iowa's chestnut harvest devastated. Pumpkin harvest devastated. Virtually all crops devastated just this past year. Weather used as a weapon? How the U.S. Mil military can use weather to destroy economies in other countries, documented military documents, that's exactly what is going on. Exactly what is going on. Not just in the United States. After posting my videos on the California fires, Lebanon, earlier, Australia. Australian farmers are bracing themselves for another long, hot summer as rivers run dry and bushfires rage across the state of New South Wales. Up to 30 houses were destroyed or seriously damaged by fire this week. The situation is at a crisis point with 98% of New South Wales either in drought 
or short on water. But as we speak, young Australian farmers are gathering at the summit to share their experiences and find some solutions. Well, joining us now is 21-year-old farmer Sally Downey. She's one of them, and she joins us from the town of Trundle. Sally, thank you so much for joining us. You've experienced many droughts uh, while growing up. How different is this one from the others? I guess it's different in the sense that it just keeps going. Uh, we've been pretty much in drought conditions since about 2017 and then really bad drought conditions since 2018 and it just it just keeps going. So it's very hard to, to maintain and kind of plan and prepare for a, such a long period of drought conditions. It keeps on going. I will link below to everything so if you want to watch the full video just click on the link below uh, it, it, it strikes me as really odd that so many are not looking into man controlling weather when man has been doing this for decades This guy says something very interesting. Well, fire authorities believe two major bushfires burning in northern New South Wales were possibly deliberately lit. Firefighters have described the fire activity on the ground as abnormal. Danica, did you... Fire activity on the ground as abnormal. Okay. Giorgio is at the control centre in Casino. Casino, Danica, uh, do we know yet when residents will be able to return home there? Tom, at this stage, they won't be able to return anytime soon, particularly given that there is still a lot of fire activity, particularly in Busby's Flat and Drake areas. Authorities gave an update a short time ago, confirming that the fire front is now between 80 and 90 kilometres. Up to 30 properties have been destroyed. At this stage, they say it's homes, sheds and other agricultural products. But when crews are finally able to access all these areas, then that figure might change, potentially throughout the afternoon. Now, crews say that they work tirelessly under very poor conditions. In fact, they've described it as some of the worst conditions they've ever experienced, particularly due to the impact of the drought that's having on New South Wales. Uh, it means that fuel moisture is low here. They haven't been able to access water, so when they are going to get water to try and fight these fires, they're being sensitive about the areas that they choose. This is a, an area that has been um, uh, water I suppose uh, sufficient for several months, um, you know, and um, vegetation is fairly stressed and it doesn't take much for it to burn. So it's burning fairly intense and uh, we're seeing fire behaviour that I would experience is not normal. Not normal. Okay. Well, sure would have liked more information about that not normal. But it's interesting when you saw him just kind of like, you know, you have to wonder if these people do know, if they do know that these fires are coming from, well, the weather terrorists creating the fires, lasers, directed energy weapons. Do they know something? You watch the body language. It's burning fairly intense and uh, we're seeing fire behaviour that I would experience is not normal. All right. Yeah. Another, another massive fire in another country. So I do want you to listen to this before I play the last video. This year has been anything but a field of dreams for a lot of farmers. Spring flooding delayed their planting season. Some couldn't plant at all. But even those who got crops in the ground are now facing another tough situation. As you're about to see in tonight's Eye on Kevel Land, this year's harvest could be a flood of problems. Kayaking in a cornfield, only in South Dakota, at least this year anyway. Jason Kokish of Tabor shot this video of him checking one of his cornfields in a kayak after heavy rain buried it under 10 feet of water last month. Take a good look at that flag. 
Now look at this. This is Kokish standing in that same field today by that same flag. The water has gone down and so are a lot of hopes. The field is, is still very wet. The, the corn is still standing, believe it or not. It was so wet on the day that we stopped by, we couldn't even get down to the field with our vehicle. So Jason shot this drone video of what it still looks like today. As you can see, there's still a lot of water, but as far as Jason is concerned, this field is done. The corn isn't going to mature. It stopped at that stage. And um, to get any kind of salvage out of it, we're probably going to have to wait till it freezes um, to get any kind of equipment down there. Um, but that, that particular field that was underwater is probably going to be a total loss. And this is why. So this is the corn that was on the flooded field down by the river. If you feel that, you can feel how spongy and soft that is. That's, uh, that's similar to what would happen if there'd be, uh, if there'd be frost on corn. And uh, this corn was just from a few miles away, planted uh, a day sooner. And uh, that's, that's what this corn should have looked like. Nice hard kernels. Jason's dad has been farming for 35 years. We've had wet years before. Um, it, it's just that uh, normally it comes in one year increment and then it, then it disappears for about 10 years and we get another wet year. But uh, these last three years been a struggle in our area. South Dakota's Ag Secretary Kim Vadiman says it could take years to recover from this year's flooding and we're all going to feel it, not just farmers. This year's growing season is definitely going to have an impact on, on the South Dakota economy. As, as you all know, that uh, agriculture is South Dakota's number one industry. And when, when things are good in agriculture, things are good on Main Street. When things are not so good in agriculture, things aren't so good on Main Street. So clearly it will have, have an effect on, on the Main Street. When the fields do dry, Jim says it'll be a small window of opportunity for farmers to get the crops out. As far as a small window, meaning that instead of having two, three, four weeks in a row, row day after day harvesting, you're probably going to have a day here or a day there where you'll be able to harvest. And that could present another problem, safety. Safety this fall is going to have to be a must. So Because people are going to be anxious. They might get in a hurry, you know, haste makes ways. Becomes Yep, and that's this fall, yeah, with the window of opportunity, there's going to be just short days to be out there, and everyone's going to want to go, 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 and just need to slow down a little bit. It's kind of okay, so the losses are tremendous this year. So many farmers have taken total losses. How? are they to recover from what has taken place. But we all know that this is intentional to destroy farming, to destroy uh, food sources. We know that. How do we get through to others in our respective countries? Australia. I'm going to play about 10 minutes of this presentation. Australians listen, but this, just because she's in Australia, speaking to Australians, everyone is facing exactly what this woman is talking about. farmers and uh, food producers are under. But let me just make the point that um, these policies come from a faraway place. 
and you're going to have to bear with me now for a few minutes while I read my speech and I will read it because otherwise I'll be up here for hours. I get a bit carried away with this so I've contained it to uh, as, as smaller um, speeches I can do. But we are in trouble and um, we all need to pull together on this. And first of all, I'd just like to thank... Um, I just want to um, pass all the people that she's thanking to hear the crux. And I'm not going to play the whole thing, so please click on the link, listen to the entire video, it's 21 minutes, and please circulate it. You guys in Australia, circulate it to your your uh, fellow Aussies. It's amazing that we cannot get through to people, but this is taking place. And wow, the destruction has been enormous. And it's been, well, for the United States, certainly, the destruction just this past year has been unprecedented increased increased like I've never seen before with the flash flooding happening pretty much every single day so we all are getting destroyed and they are at the final end here this has been going on for a very long time direction that we're going I first stumbled across Agenda 21 uh, in about 2008 and quite frankly my first uh, re reaction was to dismiss what I was reading because I didn't believe that any government in Australia would take us down this road. Then I began to see um, a legislative pattern emerging in Parliament which concerned me greatly and I also started to see the tenor of legislation that we were passing. I did air those concerns in Parliament and it was dismissed and ignored. Um, the words Agenda 21, ladies and gentlemen, were never meant to be spoken. And if they were, then of course it would be dismissed as a conspiracy theory. Because if people knew Agenda 21 and what it stood for, there's plenty of information out there where they could actually learn uh, what the end game was and governments didn't want that to be known. My dad always said to me that people only lie for two reasons. One reason is because you're ashamed of what you're doing, and the second reason is that you don't want people uh, to be warned just before you screw them. And I honestly believe that these secrets have been, thank you, <laughs> that these secrets have been kept um, for both of those reasons. Ladies and gentlemen, the origins of the environmental movement as we see it began back in 1968 when the Club of Rome was formed. The Club of Rome has been described as a crisis think tank which specialises in crisis creation. The main, purpose of this, the main purpose of this think tank was to formulate a crisis that would unite the world and condition us to the idea of global solutions to local problems. In a document called The First Global Revolution, authored by Alexander King and Bertrand Schneider, on pages 104 and 105, it stated, In searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine and the like would fit the bill. All these dangers, of course, will be caused by human intervention that will require a global response. That's the origin of global warming, ladies and gentlemen. In 1975, Australia agreed to bring in a new economic order via the Lima Declaration on the Second Conference of the United Nations Industrial Development Organisation. The outcome of this was, as I said, the Lima Declaration, which was a blueprint for the redeployment of tools, jobs, and manufacturing to the developing nations, leaving countries like Australia short of technology, a manufacturing base and jobs. Blind Freddie can now see what the outcome of that has been for our country, 
with their unworkable trade and tariffs agreements hand in hand with this that have followed as a matter of course. This is now a reality with around 90% of our agriculture and manufacturing just gone. Australia signed the Lima Declaration in a, and hundreds of others with the support of all major political players. Whitlam, Fraser, Hawke, Keating, Hewson, Howard, Rudd, the Democrats, the Greens and even the Nationals. It has been put to me that all of these treaties were the foundation for the rollout of Agenda 21 and it seems that Australia has been moved around the global chessboard and our so-called leaders were either complicit or naive to the long-term consequences and now we're almost a checkmate. Sorry. In 1992, former President of the United States, George Bush Senior said, effective execution of Agenda 21 will require a profound reorientation of human society, unlike anything the world has ever experienced. A major shift in the priorities of both governments and individuals and an unprecedented redeployment of human and financial resources. This shift will demand that a concern for the environmental consequences of every human action will be integrated into individual and collective decision making at every level. Cutting through the code, I want everyone to consider what the words profound reorientation of all human society and unprecedented redeployment of human and financial resources actually means. For everyone here tonight not familiar with Agenda 21, I would suggest that this is the beginning of your learning curve, not the end. In 1992, Maurice Strong, Secretary General of the UN Earth Summit and member of the Club of Rome said, it is clear that current lifestyles and consumption patterns of the affluent middle class involving high meat intake, consumption of large amounts of frozen convenience foods, use of fossil fuels, ownership of motor vehicles, small electrical appliances, home and air workplace air conditioning and suburban housing are not sustainable. Put those statements together with the previous one and it must become clear that Agenda 21 is about controlling every aspect of our lives. How we eat, what we eat, how much we eat, how we move around, food production, the amount of food and where we even live. Dixie Ray, former Washington State Governor and Assistant Secretary for Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs stated, Agenda 21 seeks to establish a mechanism for transferring the wealth from citizens to the third world. Fear of environmental crisis would be used to create a world government and UN central direction. From a report in the 1976 UN's Habitat One conference, land cannot be treated as an ordinary asset, controlled by individuals and subject to the pressures and inefficiencies of the market. Private land ownership is also a principal instrument of accumulation and concentration of wealth, therefore contributes to social injustice. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, if you work hard, and you exercise good financial management and invest in property, you are contributing to social injustice. I wish there was something that I could say that was really profound and uplifting to end this video. Please do click on the link below. Listen to the end of this talk. I stopped it at 10 minutes and 15 seconds. I can't think of anything because we really do need our fellow, our fellow citizens in our respective countries to look into what is happening, what really is happening with the weather that climate change, global warming, is a lie, a fraud, 
perpetrated on the entire world. And it's very easy to do the research to find out that what I just said is true. And if they understood that and did the research to find out that they are controlling the weather, bringing on floods, bringing on fires, destroying agriculture, and destroying all of our lives, well then they would all have to do that research really fast and then hit the road running. I'm afraid that that <laughs> is not possible. So prepare, prepare for your downfall because they are bringing all Western countries down to third world country status. Middle class in all countries is being eliminated. So, yes, prepare for the downfall because that is the direction that we are continuing to um, proceed and unfortunately it's all accelerating. It's heartbreaking. But this is reality. All links are below.